want to. How do I minister to somebody and how do I do that? In order for you to understand how God has taught me how to do this, then I've got to explain some things to you, okay? Um, when, he, when he began to, to call me to do this kind of thing, there was nobody ministering spiritual warfare like God has taught me how to do it. That doesn't mean I'm the only one. It means that I didn't know of anybody else, okay? And so uh, I made a lot of mistakes. So we're going to try and teach you some things that, that will help you prevent mistakes. Let me say something up front. If you are a family and you have children, if you have children that are married or you have children that are married and have children and you're concerned about their spiritual life, you can do these things because you have the spiritual authority to minister to your family because God gave it to you when you gave your heart to the Lord Christ came and lived inside of it. Okay. So, so you'll be able to do this. Now, in order to be trained, there are some things we're going to talk about tonight that, that you need to understand. This first level, come up here, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Write discovery on top of that line. See, if I were to write it, I want to talk wide and I go way out. And it looks <laughs> like chicken scratch. Discovery. Okay, the next one is ministry, right there across that one. Should I ask you to do this before? Now, draw another line down there, just like those. She has to follow lines. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a little more helpful. Okay, this is called. Um, oh, Lord, just lift my mind. Um, spiritual growth. I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> I'm assuming a couple of things when I teach you this. So. So if I say something that you think is uh, that you didn't don't understand, please say it to me. Uh, ask me questions, okay? <laughs> when I do a discovery, I count on God's Holy Spirit to come to me and tell me things about the person, along with the information that that person or family gives it. Somebody will say, well, what if you don't know that person? It doesn't matter if God leads me to pray for somebody that needs to be set free and I don't know them. Um, he will tell me what I need to pray for them about. The reason I'm talking about that is because the Holy Spirit gives you a gift. In your family, this gift is functional because you and your spouse are in harmony about spiritual principles. Let me say that again. This gift functions in a family automatically when the husband and wife are in spiritual harmony. Now, if, if the husband or wife is not in spiritual harmony, he can give it to the other person so that they can pray for family members and family situations, okay? But if you're dealing with a family situation that you need God's insight, he will give it to you. But when it's outside of the family situation, it's difficult for a person to have spiritual discernment unless God gifts them that, okay? Do you understand that? Because you cannot do this discovery. On yourself, you can. You can say, God, what's wrong with me? And he'll tell you. But if you're praying for someone outside of your family, you need to have that spiritual discernment in, sort of, in, in order for discovery to, to occur. Okay. 
Any questions? How does one get the spiritual gift of discernment of spirit? Ask. Huh? Ask. I didn't, and he gave it to me. <laughs> he said, that poor guy needs a lot. <laughs> Here, God, take what. I, I was in a, a church, Zoom, a Loon Creek United, or Loon Creek Church of the Brother in uh, Huntington, Indiana. And I was in graduate school, and I was pastoring this church. If there was only 25, 30 people in it, and it started to grow. And people were giving their life to There were 12 Sundays in a row where there was one or multiple people at the altar giving their life to the Lord. Okay. And so Jesus was really moving among that congregation. And one day I'm greeting people as they come in the hallway. And a 17-year-old boy said to me, he said, hey, hey, Pastor, I want you to meet so-and-so. I forget his name. And I turned around and I grabbed his hand. Never happened to me before in my life. The Lord spoke to me. I didn't know it was the Lord. And he said, this man's a homosexual. And so when I got done, I went to my office to pray before I preached. I asked God to forgive me for thinking terrible things about this person. Lord, I'm sorry. I don't know what's wrong with me. I've never thought that about somebody. Please forgive me. So I preached and we had the service. It was a good service. And I went home and uh, that morning at nine o'clock, I got a phone call and this man calls me and he says, I need to talk to you. I said, okay, meet me at the office. And we met and he's him hauling around. He didn't know. I didn't know what he was going to say. I had no idea. And finally, being me, I said, you're not by any chance gay. And he said, who told you? He didn't believe me. He thought somebody else told me. <laughs> and it was God. It was God. I didn't ask God to develop it. He gave it to me. Okay. Can you ask for gifts? Sure you can. I would encourage you. If you want to do ministry for somebody outside of your family, you can ask God for that gift to be working. And I'll tell you what, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are interesting because they may function for a period of time and then stop for some reason. Only God knows what it is. This gift has never stopped functioning in me. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't tell me things about people he doesn't do that. It's only in ministry settings, okay? Only in ministry settings does he tell me things. Why? Because he's a gentleman. And if you know somebody and it says, oh, the Holy Spirit said this, and the Holy Spirit said that, walk away and don't, walk, don't talk to him, okay? There's a lot of arrogant pride in that, I think. Okay, so that's the first thing you need to understand. You need to understand that the Holy Spirit has got to be active in this process. He has got to be active. There are times that I feel like I take it for granted and I go back to the Lord and I say, Lord, you know, am I taking this for granted? And he says, no, you're doing what I said. Okay, for, if I did, forgive me. I want everything to be all right with with God not. Remember, in your family, you have the spiritual right to know the conflict that's going on in your household. And you say, God, what's going on here? And he will show you about yourself, your spouse, your children. Okay. Does that, that make sense? Any questions so far? Before I ever start talking to people, I pray in my heart, usually not in front of them this way. I say, Lord, please show me what I need to know, what you want me to know about this person. This is how I function in my relationship of ministry with Jesus Christ. This is how I function in my relationship 
in ministry with Jesus Christ. Lord, please show me what you want me to know. After 30, after almost 30, I don't know how many years, 30, 40 years, I don't know. Um, the, the first three things I always write down, and I tried not to do it, and I'll tell you why I do it. The first one is fear, fear of failure, fear of rejection, all those four things. Fear of failure and fear of abandonment, fear of rejection, fear. Why? In the book of Genesis, at the fall of man, remember that? <coughs> and Adam and his wife's hiding in the bushes because they were naked. <coughs> And God comes out and he says, Adam, Adam, where are you? And Adam comes out. What's he say? Does anybody remember what Adam said to him? Yeah, because I was afraid. That's not all he said. That's, you're right. What else did he say? Because he was, he hid because he was afraid and he was naked. The major stronghold in a non-Christian's life when they come to know Christ that still hangs on 99% of the people is fear. And it manifests itself in one of those three ways. Fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of abandonment. It, it infiltrates and intertwines itself with the other Arguments, pretensions, and strongholds of your life. Okay. What I just told you, I've never told anybody, I've never taught this to anybody else. I, well, how do I know? I just, it, it happens. It's there all the time. Question Is it normal that all three of these fears would hang on? Yep. 99% of the people. In some way or another. Everybody's been abandoned sometime in their life, haven't they? If it's not a parent, a girl or boyfriend, a job. Fear of rejection. Oh, my goodness. I've got to wear the clothes everybody else does. i got to make an A. If I don't make an A, the other guys won't want to hang around with me. Fear of failure. I can't do it. I can't. I struggled with the fear of failure with Greek. I took Greek. Everybody in the class was making A's and B's, and I was failing tests. I mean, I'm a ministerial student. <laughs> I'm going to teach people about Jesus, and I can't pass Greek. I was so full of fear of rejection, and that that's when I began to pray that God would take it away from me. Take it away. Fear of failure. Take it away. One day, he took it away. I still only made a C in Greek. But the fear was gone. I'll, I'll gladly take a C and get rid of fear. Do you understand that? So, so that's an event in my life. Greek, me, me failing Greek was an event in my life. And that event manifested that fear in me, okay? If I had not dealt with it spiritually, it would have caused me other problems in my life down the road, okay? Questions, you got to ask me questions because I don't want to go here yet. Write this down. When there's a stronghold of depression, whether it's clinical depression or just depression, okay? There are three things that cause depression in a person. And if you, if the Spirit of God tells you your child's depressed, or he, if you're a minister to somebody else and he tells you that they are depressed, <laughs> It's what it's depression is a stronghold, and the three things that agitate and feed to it are any any guesses? Fear, 
anger, and guilt. That's an interesting concept. Isn't it? Fear, anger, and guilt. Fear, anger, guilt. When I tell people that that are struggling with depression and they're on one or two different medicines, and I tell them that, and I tell them that they can deal with that in them and find out what events have occurred in their life that have propagated or established it or rooted itself in them, and we pray over it, and they no longer fear, feel that the anger, the fear, and the guilt. The freedom is phenomenal for them. They, they really, by the way, anxiety has the same three things, okay? But anxiety has something different than, than experiences with depression. What's that? It depends on the person. See, that's the problem. Right. You know anybody has got anxiety? I'll ask you some questions. I'll tell you what the event is. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What? My dog. Your dog? Doctor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My dog has anxiety, but you know, that's a whole other thing. Will you forgive me? How old your dog? 18. Almost 19. Has she had anxiety long? Yeah. Does it come and go, or is it with her all the time? There's a physical illness that's triggered it, but she had some beforehand. The physical illness aggravated the anxiety is what you're saying? Mm -hmm. May I ask what it was? It's called POTS. It's a type of disorder. I know exactly what you're talking about. Came after a couple concussions. Concussions? Basketball. She was playing basketball. She got in there. I know a lot of guys that yeah. play basketball and got concussions. Yeah. I used to get knocked out whenever the ball hit him in the head. Mm. It was it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> there he goes again, guys. Let's pick him up. Put him, here we are. So it, it affected him later on. Your your daughter uh, is afraid of being rejected. I, I don't know your daughter. I don't know. There's an event or events in her life that have happened over and over again where she believes that she's going to be uh, rejected some way, some form. Not everybody will reject her, but inside of her, that anxiety is there. And in the, the incidents that have occurred in basketball, um, creates a physiological situation where it accentuates the anxiety. And it's possible with the right kind of prayer that the, uh, the, that God can begin to reverse the effects of the stroke, not strokes, I'm okay. sorry, concussions. I'm the one that had strokes and, and, and take away the fear and the anxiety will lessen or go away. A lot of times anxiety is different than fear. Fear will leave almost instantly, but anxiety takes a little bit of time for it. Not always, but sometimes it does. Is this the kind of stuff you guys want to hear? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So that helps me to know how to pray. Too. Mm-hmm. Does she know the Lord? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tell her so she can pray about it. Yeah. Say, Lord, I'm going to get rid of this. Um, Fear, anxiety. Um, When you're doing a discovery and God is giving you the authority with his Holy Spirit to to know what it is, uh, he will tell you events in the past of the person that they have forgotten about that has affected them. And, and when you say it to them, they'll, they'll say things like, how did you know that? And I didn't know it, God knew it and he told me. Okay, let, just let's, I'm not great. 
This is not a magic trip. This is a spiritual principle. And uh, I had a, a lady who was a witch, and I told her about it. But in, in the discovery process, she was telling me how she was 12 years old and the day that she got baptized and how much she loved Jesus. And then she went on and talked about something else. And the Lord said, ask her about that day. I didn't. I said, well, well, did anything happen to you on that day? And she began to break down and cry. She said, how did you know? I said, I, I just am supposed to ask you. <laughs> she said, my grandfather began to molest me. And he molested me almost every day until I asked Satan to kill him. So now I know why she was that way. And I know why she's in the cult because of hatred. See, you see. Oh, I thought she loved Satan. No, no, Satan lied to her and said, I'll give you power to kill. And she hated him so much she wanted him dead. Do you see why it, it's at times complicated? Um, I don't, but with your family, he'll tell you whatever you need to know. Remember that. No? Okay. Um, abuse. When somebody is sexually abused inside the family, when somebody is sexually abused inside the family, that family member, whether they know it or not, their evil behavior begins to train that person for a role in their adult life. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not that good a communicator. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Can you say that again? Maybe a little differently. I didn't quite connect it. Yeah, well, I'm from West Virginia. <laughs> so you have to. <laughs> <laughs> a joke just came to my mind about West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's say a father molests a, a daughter. That father's behavior begins to uh, spiritually, in an evil way, tell that young lady what kind of person she needs to be to get men's attention when they get older. Does that make sense to you? If a mother does it, then then he, he is being told by her that women were, are supposed to always control him. Those are strongholds. Those are not psychological things. And each one of them carries its own weakness, which we'll talk about down here. So, uh, so you need to understand only with wisdom and time will God teach you how these things work. I have not read psychology books. So if you think I'm not talking psychology, I have to keep telling people that because I'm, I'm not. Um, other questions? Man. All these are good questions. How do you help um, men in regards to sexual abuse? How do you I had a lady who was 46 years old and she was molested from the first day she was brought home by her grandfather until he died. And you're going to take these notes? It's, a, it's important. First of all, you need to set her free <clears throat> from the uh, sexual abuse. You, it's a stronghold, all right? You need to have her forgive the person who molested her or abused her, whichever term you want to use. Uh, depending on the length of time, if it's a long period of time, there will be events that she will remember that were worse than others. Each one of them needs to be given to the Lord and that God will break the power those events have upon her 
and to uh, break the power and free them uh, from the trauma that those events had. Okay. Uh, in sexual molestation, there is always trauma. Okay. Um, you got all that so far? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the ascent, she will have to forgive that person over and over and over and over and over till she gets sick and tired of saying, I forgive Sam Shinowski in Jesus' name. I forgive Sam Shinowski in Jesus' name. And then, and then um, you will have to ask God to show you how it affects her life down here. How, how has this stronghold, this abuse affected her life? And then that will depend on her answers because there are a multitudinous ways that sexual abuse and activity in the occult will affect a person's life. And whatever those, those things are, you stand against them individually and break the power of them. Uh, in some people, for example, when some people are sexually abused, they become rebellious. You understand? They become rebellious, and so they're they're not they don't want to do what anybody tells them to do. They're just going to do their own thing. That's because they're afraid, and they want their lives to be controlled by them and no one else. See see how they interweave weave themselves in a person's life. When God shows that during this state, that interest, the interwoven part of that, when he shows you that and you break its power, then that whole complex is destroyed by the power of Christ's blood. You understand what I'm saying? That's why the, the gift of discernment of spirit is so important. Yes. So I have a question. When you're saying the power of the stronghold, yes, I'm really visual. And so I'm thinking like in the spiritual realm, what exactly is the power that you're praying against? Like Evil. what? So is it a demon? In some cases, in many cases, yes. And if it's not, then the power is broken the power that's broken like what exactly is that what is the need of all of that in the spiritual realm is what i'm trying to like get and, and does it matter if it's a demon or no it doesn't matter if it is or not right. so i don't yes. i don't care if it's a demon or not if god tells me it is, he wants me to know for a reason okay but but if he doesn't tell me it's a stronghold and it can be a stronghold that is mental because the event had created a mental image in that person's mind. That image then dictates behavior or lack of behavior. So somebody may withdraw. It could be, uh, um, what's the word? Tell me the word, Kathy. <laughs> Kathy goes, pattern. I don't know what you're talking about. A thought pattern. Physiological. Physiological. Did you say that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. it, it can it can affect you uh, physically. Uh, you ever seen these people go around with ticks? Mm -hmm. I had a guy came in and he says, he says, I can't get rid of this. And I said, well, what do you want to? Well, I think so. <laughs> That's what he says. <laughs> And so we, we delved and we found the event that caused the tick and it was a relationship with his mother. But, but he did, he was bound by her and he did not want to release that bondage. So see, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that is emotionally as well. Okay. So it was, there was mental, physiological, it could be emotional. Uh, and it can be, um, a spiritual stronghold where they do not understand who God is. And so they may think God hates them and will never do it. He'll help everybody else. I have a, a lady, she goes and prays for people. And God does miracles, but her life's a mess because she doesn't think God loves her. So see, that's a, that's a stronghold. Okay. Does that make any sense? 
that yeah yeah no it's i mean it's it's all evil it's all evil but it's just pretty incredible the power of god i mean this is just what i'm mean, i'm just like amazed I mean, I've been through deliverance before, and it's like I just came out with this. But I mean, the power of God in this to go into a person's all of those areas of a person, the whole person, the whole person. It's it's really a miracle. Mm -hmm. I would agree. That's God, right? I mean, it's a miracle. Yes, we'll get to that in a minute. That's good. Someone else. I have a question on discovery that was comes to my mind. If you're given a spiritual discernment of discovering something about somebody, does that mean that you should always share with that person what God no. has shown me? Okay. Wonderful <laughs> mm -hmm. question. No, no one. See, when when I had gotten the spirit of, the, uh, spirit of discernment, no one was around to tell me. I had to look it up in the Bible to see what it was. And nobody told me. And I thought in my humanness that whatever God told me, I needed to tell that person. Yeah. Disaster. So how do you know? Do you, do you, do you talk to God? Yes. Do you ask him questions? Sometimes. <laughs> what an honest lady. <laughs> so if you want something from your husband, who do you ask? Your husband, right? Or sometimes I ask God for it. <laughs> to tell him. <laughs> so if you can ask God to tell your husband to do something for you, you need to ask God what he wants you to do with what he with gave. That information. Yeah. Ask, 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 ask God. If things aren't changing, you're not asking the right question. Can I ask a follow-up on that? <laughs> question? Sure. Sure. Um, I'm thinking of a specific thing that happened to me a long time ago, but um, I was given a word, whatever you call it, Word something about someone that I was in a discipleship group with and I kind of asked a question that was very point on and it was correct and I did feel like I definitely got that from the Lord and it just seemed to bring everything into the light that need, that I thought needed to be in the light um, but unfortunately the person seemed to do well with it that night but then had a really bad week and everything just went downhill. She actually quit the group. She didn't want to deal with the stronghold. And that I just felt horrible. Did you forgive yourself? Yeah. Okay. I did. Nah, she's not sure. But then I also wasn't sure. I did, but I wasn't sure, like, did I do something wrong? Or is it just, did I do it right? No, and you're she in, didn't respond correctly. As a born-again Christian, you're in training. There is not a day you're not in training. So God was training you with that experience mm -hmm. to know how he wanted you to act in the future. Yeah. And he can't, he will, I guarantee, make sure that lady comes across somebody somewhere to be ministered to. Remember, God loves these people mm -hmm. more than we do. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. I still want to cause more harm than good. As I'm getting trained, you know, as, as, as <clears throat> you will, I'm, I'm sorry, you will, <laughs> yeah. you will. I mean, we're human. Mm -hmm. Remember this, God works in spite of us, yes. not because of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> Do you like that? I loved it. <laughs> that came from the Lord. I didn't think of it. <laughs> That's for sure. Because I was struggling with a lady. Uh, she had OCD, and she'd been to Minerith Meyer Clinic. She'd been under the care of a psychologist for 13 years. 
and she came to me and she was OCD. I did not understand. I did some background. And I said, what did he tell you? It calls it. He says, no, it's just a behavior problem. I said, okay. And I said, Lord, what is it? And he said, it's fear. So I could minister to her because I knew what it was. I could. So every time she was afraid, the events where it occurred to her, I had to deal with every one of them. She was 40 some years old. Mm -hmm. And I had to deal with each one of them. If you're going to be trained in this, there will be times where people will see things when you're talking to them that's not there. They will smell things that you don't smell that's not there. They will hear things. Phones will ring. Those are called radical manifestations. I eventually wasn't afraid. But there were times I were. I was afraid, okay? I'm human. Good question. Somebody else. You can ask about the radical <clears throat> manifestations. What's that? Do you, with the radical manifestations, do you ignore them in those? In the middle of those sessions? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. You you tell I come against in Jesus' them. name that has to leave. Yeah, I, or be quiet. Mm -hmm. I had a, a lady, a young lady came to me. She went to an art school in Pittsburgh and she got involved with a, a warlock. Oh. And he made love to her in a pentagram. Mm -hmm. Guess what that guy did to her? He made her believe he was she was a, a serpent. And she would get on the floor and crawl. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so she came, she came to me, she said. Her sister says, we've been to two Pentecostal preachers and a Baptist today, and they don't know what to do with her. And I said, why do you think I know what to do with her? <laughs> and, so, and so she, I began to talk to her. We prayed. I began to talk to her. And she eased up on the front of her, her, uh, her seat, and the girl said, she's going to turn. She's going to turn. I said, what do you mean? She's going to become a snake. I said, no, she's not. Mm -hmm. In the name of Jesus, serpent, I bind you and command you to be quiet and be gone. And you let this woman relax and, and so we can set her free. And she relaxed and she sat back in her chair. She never had another problem. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's the spiritual authority that God gives you. That's the second thing. The Holy Spirit gives us authority. It's the Holy Spirit gives us insight. You, you, you understand? He gives us authority and eventually gives us victory. Is this okay for everybody? This is a little this is a little bit out over the top. Is John okay back here, Dave? <laughs> Someone else. I have a question, Pastor Mike. So, um, with the with yes, the, Victoria, <laughs> with the stronghold of sexual abuse, um, I, I don't. I just want to make sure. Are you saying that you have to go through each and every? If 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 the Spirit of God gives you leading to do that, you do it. I see. Okay. Sometimes it's as easy as making a list of the person that it depends on it depends on the spiritual nature of what's going on with that person. See, I don't know how to explain that to you. You need to be able to see what God sees. I don't know how else to say it. I'm not God. I don't claim to be God. But he wants these people free, and Jesus has given us the authority to set them free. He's done that. And we need to know how to use that authority based on the information he gives you through the Spirit of God. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. See, you, I can write down a stronghold, but Jesus knows the, the details of how it functions in a person. He knows. So when I say in the name of Jesus, be broken and cleanse this person and be gone, Jesus not only deals with that, it deals with many other things that are going on with that event in that person's life. Okay, we're going to quickly move on. If you have questions, we could come back to it. The, the second part of discovery is I write down all the people that have hurt or harmed that person, caused pain or trauma in their life. They need to forgive that person in the name of Jesus. And I shared with you before that the forgiveness is out of obedience, not because you feel like forgiving. You, I've told people, you could say, I hate my father, but I forgive him in Jesus' name. Nothing wrong with that. Okay? People will say, you can't say that to people. Well, if it's the truth, Jesus said, if you live in the truth, the truth will set you free, right? He shall. Okay. So, so, and then we go down each thing. I forgive my mom in Jesus' name. I forgive my dad in Jesus' name. I forgive brother this and brother that. I forgive the pastor. I forgive this church. I forgive the government. Okay. Are you naming the offense one or just simply? We've already talked about the offense. The offense and I'll yeah. just... But that would take that would take another day and I don't want to put people through that. And it always works. I mean, it has not, not worked. Okay. Does that help? I mean, because we're saying it in the name of Jesus. So we're, we're, we're being what Jesus said, forgive one another, even as I have forgiven you. So when I forgive in the name of Jesus, I am saying, as you died on the cross for me, I forgive that person. Okay. Any questions about that? And we'll talk about that again down here. Um, the other thing is we pray against the sins of the forefathers. If there is no historical background of abuse, such as, like it says in Nehemiah cha chapter one, it says, my father's and my forefather's house have all sinned against you. We had acted very wickedly towards you. If, if a family are alcoholics, I, I usually stand against alcoholism. Or if they're involved in the occult, if there's a history of two or three different families or people in families that are dealing with the occult, you, you take authority over that. If they belong to a cult like Masons and think of an occult, Unitarian Church. Okay. No political parties are not a cult. <laughs> Nobody laughed. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure? They are. <laughs> Spiritual discernment. <laughs> okay. um, then we then uh, then we take that authority. Um, the prayer goes something like this. It doesn't have to be exactly this way, people. This is not a formula. This is a conceptual application of biblical truth. Okay. Uh, dear Lord, I love my family. I love my father's family, my grandfather's family, but, but they've acted very wickedly towards you. And you tell us that the sin of our forefathers have visited on the third and fourth generation. I just ask in Jesus' name that you break the power of my forefathers upon me in Jesus' name, upon me and my children and my children's children. And fill us with your Holy Spirit. Protect us from them. And uh, well, I just went black. Forgive me. And begin a new heritage in my family, starting with me today. Okay. Uh, 
some really bad things is if a family has a womanizer or a lady that commits adultery in their past. I had one family, I have several families, not just one, where every woman and man that got married were pregnant. Now, do you not think that's a curse? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, because God doesn't want that to happen. People whose families are in jail. I mean, you could name a lot of things. Alcoholism, drug addiction, pornography. You don't know how many people, men that I minister to, that their fa father or mother introduced them to, back when I was younger, magazines. And now it's the internet. Movies about pornography. That, that is a curse. And I guarantee you that your children will be tempted with it and not know why. My brother called me up one day, godly man, uh, good man. And he said, Mike, he said, he said, do you have a problem with this? And I said, what are you talking about? He said, he says, when I'm at work, he said, I'm tempted to go talk to these women. Because I'm attracted to them. I said, sure. Well, how do you deal with it? I said, I forgive my father for being womanizing. And I take authority over that in my life and ask it, ask it to not be visited on me or my sons or daughters and their children. I prayed that for my boys. I can't tell you how many years. And he said, okay, I never heard from him since then. We see each other, we never, he's, he's a good man, married to a good woman. But we can be tempted by those things and we may not even know what it is. I had a man tell me that every time his family got together for a birthday, a baby being born, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Fourth of July, everybody brought whiskey and booze and they got drunk till they could not know where they were at or what they were. And he said that his grandfather was there, his father was there, and he was there. He struggled with alcohol. So we took authority over the sins of the forefather. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Do you know that guy? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not one. Um, when you're dealing with, like, you, you mentioned, like, secret societies, Freemasons, stuff like that. You just do that in a different kind of, no, like, more in depth kind no, of capacity. No, if or, we've got, if we've got up here uh, a secret society, when I minister, I, I take authority over the occult because a covenant is made, covenant is made with those societies that need to be broken. And so we do that down here. Good question. We've been through a lot of that breaking off things, and I know there's different ways. A lot of different ways. But Jesus was the one that does it. Someone else. We're not even down here. What time is it? Because they got to go to a movie. 843. <laughs> that, that's soon. You got to leave that soon. Can you guys listen quicker? <laughs> So when I minister to somebody, the first thing that I deal with is sin of the forefathers. And I, I shared with you the prayer. Got that? The second thing I do is I go through the list where they need to forgive people. There are times, if it's severe enough, we deal with the person in a little, an extra prayer. And that sounds really bad. You focus God's attention on that person in that person's life for a little bit. Okay. I've had people that have four or five names, and I've had people that had 27 names, depending on what their certain situations are. Okay. And then the person does not have to have their eyes bowed for this part right here. Um I want them to look at me, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Because they are renouncing 
this stronghold. And what that means is that you do not want it in your life anymore. You stand against it, okay? And so you renounce every one of them. Fear, fear of failure, fear. We just go down the line. When we get to things like she said, the occult, when you pray against the occult and you minister to them, you... You say, well, I never made a covenant with the devil. No, you don't. But you did if you were involved in it or if it's passed on to you from a family member. You say, I renounce the occult and Satan in Jesus' name. And I take authority over the covenant that has been made for me or by me with the devil and and I say that it is no longer in effect with me. I do not want it, break it, and cleanse it from me. I affirm and recommit my covenant with Jesus Christ, who is the resurrected Son of God. That's the way. Now, if that person was in, how many different ones did we stand against? Well, there's a whole bunch of them. Let's see them. A few. There were several things, Kat. Do you mind if I use your Not example? at all. She was, she was involved in several different kinds of occultic behavior. And so we had to break power over each one of them. Okay. And then I take authority over, once we're done praying, I take authority over them in the name of Jesus and I, I usually 99% of the times quote Luke chapter 10, verse 18, the authority given to us over all the power of the enemy. I take that authority in Jesus' name, and I bind it and rebuke these strongholds and command them from this person and ask Jesus to begin to heal them. Depending on the person and complexity of what we're dealing with, it may be a little bit longer prayer, okay? Oh, by the way, I forgot this. Will you guys forgive me? Go back. Down here in ministry, when uh, there, there are more and more people that I have to deal with their mind. And so, and so I, I take authority, and, uh, and I have them pray this prayer after me. Say, dear Lord, I love you, and I take captive every thought in my mind that raises itself above the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I command it to be submissive to the Lord. Cleanse my mind wherever these thoughts were and fill it with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit heals people. Okay. So that's what I do with the mind. Usually the foggy mindedness and inability to understand things changes. I mean, there, there's a lot of dynamics that occur with that. Our ability to see God changes and to understand God changes. You know, I'm talking faster. There's other things that I'm not telling you because I can't remember. <laughs> Any, any questions about that? This part down here. I need to move just a little bit. When a stronghold has been a part of a person's life, for many years, or through rebellion, it has seeded itself deep into a person. <clears throat> Those strongholds weaken the person. Okay? So we, we do this, we do the ministry. <coughs> oh, by the way, see, I'm sorry. Then after I'm done, I anoint them three times in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I take authority over them again and ask God to heal them. 
I do this funny thing where I say start at the bottom and move up through them and just cleanse everything out of them and fill them with your Holy Spirit down to the feet. That's just me. I don't even know where I heard that. Okay. So when these ingrained or deep strongholds are in a person, they, they create a weakness. So let's say a person is afraid. That's a simple one. And they've been afraid all their life. I need to understand that. I need to understand how deep that fear is. If they choose to come back for further discipleship, they will come back and they'll say, this has happened. Why is this going on? Or why hasn't that taken care of? And I tell them that based upon the information that you gave me, this was a deep-seated um, stronghold and and you need to be conscious of it and you need to tell somebody look you need to ask God to fill you in that area of your life many times in a, in a day if it's serious and ask God to heal you in it if it's a deep trauma like an accident or somebody tried to kill you or somebody raped you or you had an abortion, that creates a weakness in it. Some of it is because of grief. Some of it is because of fear. Some of it is his anger. See, you have to, God needs to show you what the detriments are so that you can counsel them and pray with them so that they can grow better, healthier. It's like weed in a garden. Then. See what I mean? Got a garden. I almost had one. <laughs> I grow weeds. You guys grow weeds? Yeah. I got dirt. You got dirt. Yeah. Congratulations. Uh, on the way. <laughs> so so that's that's important. Uh, let me okay. Gee, there's so much stuff. When you're dealing with somebody who's an alcoholic, that's what society says they are, you cannot pray against alcoholism. The devil will go, <laughs> what's he talking about? Drunkenness. Huh? Drunkenness. Sin of drunkenness. Well, I said, God, what's drug abuse? He said, self-abuse. So I drink, I, I pray against self-abuse. It, it, it's, it's a, it's a hatred towards yourself. Yeah. Sin of adultery. Not the sin of having an affair. It's a sin of adultery. When you do that, you've actually agreed with God what God calls the sin. And when you do that, then the authority of Christ can rest upon that, those issues. Okay. It's time for you guys to leave yet. Very close. Mm -hmm. We're okay for that. Time to up, go. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? You need to go. Yeah, in a couple minutes, I'm going to step out for a second. Okay. Do I hear a doll? <laughs> I think the there dog needs help. Did you hear it? <laughs> he, got, he got muted. Timmy's in the well. <laughs> Speaking up. I, I guess I, I, I would say I'm wasted. Anything, anybody got questions? Come back next week and we'll ask them all to you. <laughs> well, Brianna will be here and you can ask her. And I'll sit over there somewhere where Pez is. Pez? Pez. 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 Thank you.
for me to, to sit down with somebody and do this, number one, it would be unfair to that person because God ought to, when I'm ministering to somebody, I can't pretend. You understand? It just happens. So this is the best way I know to explain it to you. And, and the reason that greater levels of freedom comes is through this down here because most people go through deliverance and they're just, they go home and tell them to read their Bible, go to church, pray, but you need some discipleship. Some people need a lot of discipleship. One lady I ministered to for nine years, she got completely free, but it took nine years because of the trauma. Another lady I've ministered to for over seven or eight years, but she's free. If you, if I told you she was obs an obsessive compulsive, what is it when you're high and low? Yeah, bipolar. Bipolar. <clears throat> bipolar. If you met her, you'd never know she was bipolar. Mm. You would never know. Okay. A lot of this depends upon the attitude of the person who comes to you for help. The only people that doesn't matter to is if it's in your family and your children involved. You have authority. Let's say they get married and they act like horses behind after they get married. You still have spiritual authority. Not to lecture them, but to go and intercede to the Lord and ask him to change things. See, if I sit here, I'll think of something else. So I'll just pray. Lord God, thank you for these precious people. You have given me as a gift to me to, that I could talk to them and tell them what you've taught me. Lord, if they understand it or they forget something, please bring it to their remembrance by your spirit's name, the name of Jesus. And help them to grow and mature as we continue on as long as they want. Help us be able to train in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.